like right now I can I'm I can I'm conscious of that but I can talk at the same time it's a, it's where your mind is is uh, you get you have you, you can reflect you can you can talk you're not kind of shut away you're not having to reject the world and concentrate on anything because in that space in the empty mind then one is quite capable of working or doing speaking uh, doing what one has to do as a human being in the empty mind where if you're concentrated on refined states then you have to shut away things if I'm going into a high level of concentration I can't talk to you anymore to close my eyes, can't look at you anymore. And if you're coughing or sneezing, or you have to have to go someplace where there's no noise, they're distracting sounds, and uh, to keep everything like go off to a cave, in the dark cave, where there's no sound and no light, and I can really get this powerful, high conscious state. But as soon as I leave. And there's sounds and distracting things around. Then, uh, then it's gone. And what good is it? Except that it, it's very nice while you can control the environment. But once you're out of control, uh, you, you're, you're subject to even because you've attached to that refined state. You find the rest of the world even more coarse, more unbearable than it was before. I remember. Going, trying to get these high states of consciousness, and then you, then I, then I'd go back. I remember wa- walking one time in the town, in Thailand, in Nong Khai, and I was in a state of heightened awareness, and everything was just too much for me. I just, <laughs> it's like life was just beating on me punching me wherever I look. <laughs> Just ordinary street scene in in Nong Kai was like which hadn't really bothered me much before, but in that state it was like being bruised all the time. Now this isn't that this isn't high like that. This is this is clear but not high. So that you can operate in the world without Without having to reject it, this is a very it's a balanced state. In other words, it's where where we can abide and we can live our lives wisely, without having to run away from anything, without having to create something special for ourselves in order to survive. Reflections on the Four Noble Truths. Night before last, on the first one on dukkha, the suffering, existential anguish of our human condition, ignorance, grasping at mortality, wrong identification, not understanding things as they really are, so that there's this suffering. Human a common human experience. This suffering should be understood. There is this suffering, it should be understood, and by practicing then we, be, we have insight that there is this suffering. It is, it is understood there is this, this suffering is here. It's in the, something in the mind, is it? The unenlightened person is always blaming somebody else. We think it's... Uh, due to somebody else that I'm unhappy, or we blame ourselves as a personality. We think there's something wrong with me, something basically wrong, uh, so that uh, that's the reason why I'm unhappy. 
And then this blaming of oneself or others, or external forces, for one's existential anguish. But in this reflection on the first noble truth, it's merely seeing it as it is, not as a personal thing anymore, no longer uh, blaming others or, or with the view of blaming yourself, but mere a recognition, awareness of it as it is. Wanting something we don't have, not wanting what we have. The fears and anxieties, the sickness, uh, old age, death, um, the only the uh, sorrows and grief. All these things are common to all of us. Then the second noble truth, which I talked about, the samudhaya. There is a beginning or an origin to suffering. It's something that arises. It's not the ultimate truth. So even though it's a common human experience, it's not an ultimate truth. It's not absolute. It's merely uh, conditioned into our lives through (coughs) ignorance and not understanding things. So it has an origin. So that we look for the origin of it in our own mind, not abstracted out, theorizing about the origin of suffering as if it was due to Adam and Eve, uh, Adam eating an apple and therefore we're suffering the consequences. I don't think you believe that anymore. <laughs> so that that we began to look at the origin of the, what what is the origin of suffering in in our mind. So we start looking at desire, desire for sense pleasures, this sense of grasping this this movement. There's the there's there's desires going on natural desires, and we grasp them. So we, we be, we're caught always in this movement of desire, being pulled along by desire for sense pleasures, or desire for becoming, or desire for getting rid of. Three kinds of desires. So we see this grasping at desire is the problem. So the insight is it should be laid aside should be let go of, desire should be let go of. And then the and then the actual practice of letting go, the actual practice of letting go of desires, then there's the insight that desires have been let go of. The origin of the origin of suffering has been laid aside, has been abandoned. So those are those are the Three stages for each of those two noble truths. This is a a kind of formula, Buddhist formula to remember, a way of contemplating. Note that there's the statement of the problem. There is dukkha, there is an origin to dukkha. Then there is the suggestion to the mind that it should be understood, the, the dukkha should be understood and the origin should be laid aside and then the realization from the actual practice of having done that, the insight in that dukkha has been understood and that the origin of dukkha has been laid aside. Then the third noble truth. Now we're getting to, to the more interesting one of niroda or cessation. So cessation is... is um, Something that most uh, people in our society know nothing about. I was invited several months ago to a group uh, to give a talk to a group of psychology students at the University of London, uh, and I decided to talk about cessation because I knew that none of nobody would know anything about it in psychology, and I was right. Cessation has not been has not been understood by psychology yet. At least most not. I imagine there are a few, maybe Buddhist psychologists that understand it. 
<laughs> but generally, modern psychology has not understood this, the third noble truth. They kind of get the, they're, they're already kind of intuited the first two, some of them, but the third one is, is still to be discovered by the Western mind, cessation the truth of cessation. Now having let go, say, from the, from the insight into the second noble truth, of laying aside or letting go or abandoning desire, through having done that, then you have the realization there is the cessation of suffering. It's called duk, uh, niroda satcha the cessation of suffering, there is the cessation of suffering. So you have that insight, by laying aside desire, letting go of desires, then you have this insight into the third noble truth, there is a cessation of suffering. It's like grasping fire, and say, you're holding on to some fire, and you say, oh, it's so painful, it's so burning, what, what do I do? I say, lay it aside. And so you, you lay it aside and then you realize, oh, cessation of the burning. <laughs> it's quite obvious, isn't it? Cessation of suffering. So when you let go of things uh, and you actually reflect on it, you're not just suppressing uh, or getting rid of things out of aversion. You're actually just letting, laying them aside, like this clock. Like last night I gave that demonstration of laying it down. Do it again, just like that. If it's fire, you could do a little more quickly, I think. <laughs> but the attitude is one of non-aversion, of just letting go of things, rather than this annihilating tendency of getting rid of things. Because that, you're creating more fire with that. You're burning yourself even more by trying to get rid of everything. But laying down things, letting go of things, then you realize uh, that there is an end to suffering. And this end should be realized. Realized, to, to make it, to really make this very clear, to realize this, the state of your mind when there's no suffering. To really meditate, like we've been doing that in in our practice. Now just like beginning, being aware of the space around a thought. I am a human being. There's emptiness, there's no, there's not the, if you, if you abide in that empty state, in the, then you don't, you aren't looking for anything. Of course desires will start wanting you to start looking for something, habit formations. But at least for a moment, if you really contemplate that empty state of mind, if you really contemplate that and really reflect on it, you realize that that's quite a blissful place to be in, is emptiness. Peaceful, still. So you've realized that, that it should be realized, and then there is the insight that cessation has been realized. Now, ceasing, cessation, is, is in the flow of nature. Things that arise cease. It's the natural flow of things. You're not, you're, you're not out of ignorance and grasping and stupidity, uh, making, getting rid of things. You're allowing things to cease according to their nature. Now, when you don't do that, what we, what we uh, sometimes cessation, uh, we think is annihilation, getting rid of things is cessation, but that's not. Cessation in the Rhoda, the Bollywood Naroda, means allowing things to go according to their nature. So that you're, you're but, but annihilation is getting rid of them according to your desire, isn't it? There's a great deal of difference. So annihilationists are trying to get rid of things out of desire, to get rid of, where the Buddhists are letting things cease according to their nature. And that is a, that makes all the difference. 
So you realize the truth of cessation takes you to peace and calm, stillness. Where annihilation takes you to, to uh, confusion and suppression and fear. So whatever you're getting rid of and trying to annihilate is going to cause you fear and anxiety. But when you let things cease, then, things, then that takes you to stillness and peace and calm. You're not interfering with the natural flow according to what you want as a per, out of fear and desire and thinking, I don't want these things, I want the world to be different and always kind of manipulating, controlling, suppressing, annihilating uh, everything. Your life is just one busy effort to, to manipulate everything according to your desires and fears. And what happens? You feel increasing amount of anguish. The amount of existential anguish will multiply very quickly the more you try to control and manipulate life according to your desires and fears. So the more desires you have, the more frightened you are, then is an enormous burdensome uh, thing this, this life becomes. It's just increasingly heavy as you get older. It becomes more unbearable because of that, of annihilation, of trying to grasp and keep and hold on to and then get rid of. Just note the state of our society now. They were here in Europe. We're all concerned now about the uh, environment. We hear terrible predictions about the pollution of the environment. Why? Because we've been trying to annihilate everything and create all kinds of things for our desires out of our desires to have everything we want and to get rid of everything we don't want. And what happens is we pollute the planet. The word ecology now, before, say, 20 years ago, never knew what, never heard that word, ecology. And now it's uh, it's a very common word. Study of the environment. Trying to realize a natural order where human beings fit into the environment rather than just exploit it and impose their desires onto it and pollute it, is what we've been doing. And we've, out of ignorance and greed and fear, we have been polluting not only ourselves, our minds, our bodies, but the planet that we live on. When you think about the nuclear testing on the planet, when you really contemplate that, that is the most stupid thing to be doing. Dropping nuclear bombs on, on the planet. It's like dropping nuclear bombs on your home, isn't it? Would you go around dropping nuclear bombs on your home? <laughs> oh, if you were crazy, you would. You might go and drop nuclear bombs on somebody else's home. (laughs) Now that's the mentality, isn't it? We think as long as it's somebody else's home, it's all right, as long as it's not ours. The French are busy trying to do their kind of nuclear experiments in the Pacific, because it's not their home, is it? (laughs) Of course, the people in the Pacific don't like it at all because it's their home, but that's different because it's not, uh, France is not, doesn't consider that their home, it's far away. But when you realize that the planet, the whole planet is our home, whether it's on the Pacific side or the Atlantic side, and you realize that if you're going to bomb part of it, it's going to affect the rest of it, then you begin to get the point that that maybe uh, this tendency to, to just impose our will and desires and fears onto the environment is destroying the very things that we, the, very, the beauty of the planet and its livability.
wanting to destroy the pests, you know, spraying crops and all that, trying to get rid of the pests. And so the more we try to wage war on the pests and invent pesticides, they, they now have, the, I was told by a scientist, that they have very few alternatives left, that the pests eventually adapt and learn to uh, uh, survive the latest uh, horrible uh, killing pesticide, and then they come back, and then they have to figure out a new one to annihilate the pests, and it keeps going on. Now they're almost totally out of new ideas. They've kind of reached the limits. So the pests will start taking over again. And then uh, then these chemical plants, like the Union Carbide, seem to have endless problems because actually the pesticides now are beginning to leak out of the factories and kill the real pests, the human beings. <laughs> because if we, I think we're the real pests to this planet, more than the uh, than the little insects, and because we've managed to destroy and pollute so much of it, so that maybe these pesticides we're building and these we are developing, and these nuclear weapons will destroy, will end up being the very pesticides that kill us. Maybe that's the way, it, that's comic justice. Everything turns, the Frankenstein monster turns on the, on the creator. That's a grim thought, isn't it? <laughs> a sense of comic justice in it, though, but, and say, that there's also, say, within human potential, something greater. I mean, we can be pests and nuisances, or we can be, we can be that which is, uh, can actually be the instruments which will bring blessings to this planet and to all the creatures on it. Like this evening, we, we've been chanting every evening the Metta Sutta, spreading Metta and sharing our goodness and our, our blessedness with all sentient beings. So human beings, we can we have a choice of being selfish little pests that are more dangerous than any of the pests that they make pesticides for, and or we can be noble beings which can bear blessings. Where the, that which is benevolent, that which blesses everything, can manifest through these bodies into this onto this planet. So I think that's where we should start looking, is toward that more, that potential for the perfection and the true nobility of the human being, rather than just thinking maybe annihilating them is the only thing left for us to do. Because after all, I'm a human being too, and I don't want, the idea of being annihilated isn't particularly pleasing. But ceasing, cessation, is somehow very pleasing, very peaceful. When I let selfish desires, stupidity, fears, anxiety, greed and all that cease in my mind, when I just let them go, lay them aside, and then they cease, I experience cessation or stillness, calm, there's the the mind itself, the mind ground is like that. It's like it's true. It's blissful. It's calm. It's still. It's bright. And as I let go and lay aside my stupidity, laying it aside, then it all ceases in this in the mind ground, in the stillness, in the peace, in the calm. So one experiences calm, a calm outlook, a peaceful mind, an empty mind. And an empty mind is like a spacious mind. There's room for things to come and go in it. It's not locked up, it's not fixed, it's not, it's not uh, discriminating and picking and choosing and prejudiced and frightened. It's free so that whatever comes can go, can cease in it. Because there's this knowing, knowing that all that arises ceases in the mind. 
So this is, this is what Buddhas know. This is what the Buddha, when he was enlightened, realized. Gautama the Buddha. What did he realize when he, when he sat under the Bodhi tree, sat there and contemplated all this till he realized the truth. He was enlightened. Then he gave the teach in a very direct way. All that is subject to arising is subject to ceasing. And all that and all that is anatta or not self. This word anatta, not self. You cannot find yourself, in other words. You can only be that. So in meditation now you're being that, being yourself by observing what is not self. So as we sit here and meditate, as we walk, being alert, being awake, being using our ability to reflect, wisely reflect on the way things are, the simple characteristic of anicca, all that all that arises ceases. And that's in regard to everything that you can think of, that you perceive in your mind, conceive of, emotions, sensory objects, sense organs themselves, the bodies, the consciousness that arises. All this is, all that is subject to arising is subject to ceasing. But now your emphasis is on cessation, noting cessation. Become aware of this cessation. Now when you practice this evening, really really reflect on when, when you observe the space in the mind, the space around a thought. Really take that image, listening to one thought and noting the space. So you become very familiar with the space of the mind, the empty mind. It becomes something you can turn to it. Whenever you get lost in your emotions and fears and all that, you turn, you realize you're, you're getting carried away with things. You can always turn to the silence, the space. That sound of silence. The primordial sound. Sound of the mind or whatever it is. It's the sign for emptiness. Now don't attach to that as anything, but observe it, know that. And you can reflect, reflect from that empty mind. Because in that, in space, then you can, you can actually bring things up. You can look at things. When you know how to let things go, let things cease, then you don't have to be constantly manipulating and controlling everything around you, because you can actually take things up and look at them. Oh, yes. And then lay it down without making a problem about it. If all I know is grasping, and I'm afraid of it, then I shouldn't be grasping, and then I go grasping the clock again, I'm making a problem about it. You know, I'm, I'm obsessed with time. I've got to have my clock with me. And then I'm making problems. I get angry. I prove that I'm not attached. I'll throw it away. So forth. I can make a real problem out of just picking up a clock. But in an empty mind, what? There's, there's space for picking up clocks and putting them down without making problems. Isn't it? You don't have to, doesn't have to be a problem or anything complex. It's just this way. When it's time to look at the clock, then you can do so without making a problem about it. When it's time to eat food, you can eat food without making it into a complex and difficult thing. When it's time to talk to somebody, when it's time to work, when it's time to go to bed, when uh, time to bathe, so forth. All these things are part of our lives so that they can be seen in perspective through emptiness rather than just mere perfunctory habits 
or make them into complex personal problems. Like I've known many a monk to make life into a problem, like like eating food in the Thailand, in the monastery. Sometimes some of the Western monks especially, very good at complicating everything. We, they make a problem about eating food. So that we'd, we, we always eat from an alms bowl, you see, so they put the food in the alms bowl and then they'd, then the compla- complicated minds of some of the Western monks would think, I'm not going to, I shouldn't feel any greed for this food. But I'm so greedy. <laughs> you know, because you feel it's natural and you're hungry, you feel kind of natural desire to eat food. Perfectly natural thing to feel. But then they they take it and just make it into a personal thing, like I'm a very greedy person. I want to dive into the bowl and gobble it all down. So then they then they start trying to control it. So that they 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 try to, to make it difficult. They go on fast. Some monks will go on fast. I think they're anorexic. <laughs> some, of them, some of them start, and then they get lost in it. And they're trying so hard not to be greedy. And they feel guilty. They spend the afternoon feeling guilty. But in an empty mind, you reflect that this is alms food for, this is the food for eating, for taking care of the body, bodily needs and so forth, and then you eat it. It's just part of it. And one can eat with an empty mind. And one can still taste the flavors, good and bad. It doesn't destroy anything, but it doesn't, it's, it's not complicating. It's allowing things to be, knowing that this is a, a very, this is a, a, a the right thing to be doing when you're eating a meal, to eat it. Uh, it's not nothing wrong or greedy. The body needs food. It's not personal anymore. It's not like, if I, if I want to make it into a problem, I'm greedy and I shouldn't be, because I feel a, an attraction towards this food. I want to eat it. But when I reflect on it, I realize this is a very natural uh, uh, thing for the body. The body needs food, so the body is very much attracted, wants wants to consume that food when it's hungry and it needs it. So then one feeds the body without making it into a personal, complicated situation. The same with sleep or or whatever. Uh, situations in life with an empty mind you can there's room for what has to be done for for talking to others for working for uh, living one's life as a member of the society cessation doesn't mean that we get rid of everything and then we and that's it we live in a kind of void all the time I mean, that'd be nice. I'd actually like to do that, live in a state of this blissful state and not have to talk or work or do anything but because it's, it's a nice place to be in. It's, but we can't do that, can we? Somehow life doesn't allow us. It's always making us do other things. Like, uh, I remember in uh, our teacher in Thailand was very good at kind of not letting us attach to to that blissful state. Realize it and know it, but we also had to work, we had to teach, and we had to do all kinds of things that we didn't particularly want to do. Once you start there, sitting practice, sometimes you don't want to do anything else. You hear people, modern day meditators, on the meditation circuits, they I heard somebody talking one time. I went and sat in Sri Lanka. And then I sat in Burma. And I went over and I sat in California. And I sat in, in IMS in Massachusetts. And went and sat in England. Sat in Switzerland. 
There's a new way of talking, isn't it? You don't have a holiday anymore. You go and you go and sit somewhere. You don't go to Switzerland to see the the Alps anymore. You go to Switzerland to sit. But during this retreat, the reason why we're emphasizing sitting and uh, quiet and all this is because it's in contrast to maybe what your life is most of the time, where you have to live a very active life. You may not have much opportunity or occasion for sitting for long periods of time. So this we try to provide. But this is not the be-all or end-all of meditation. This is merely a kind of extreme situation, very kind of set up and controlled for uh, this practice, but don't think that this is the way it has to be all the time. Because when you leave here, then you have to go back to your ordinary living situations and all the things that you have to bear with in those particular places. But if you are increasingly more aware of emptiness and cessation, then you can bear with those uh, if your if your life is complicated or you're uh, working in a in a job that is quite difficult or your family life is complicated or all this kind of thing you can you can reduce the complications by taking it all to emptiness so at least you aren't making problems about those things anymore you begin to let them go when you let them go, then you can cope with them in a much better way. Because you see them differently than when you're attached. When you're attached to that, attached to your family, attached to your work, attached to your home, attached to your relatives, and you get all, it gets very complicated and, and, uh, and sometimes just a hopeless, unsolvable situation arises. At least it seems like that. But in an empty mind, one begins to be aware of how to do things in a way that you wouldn't be aware of when you're attached. It's like seeing things in perspective, isn't it? If you're just obsessed with something like this, I can't see anymore. It's like an obsession, it's like this, it blinds you. Can't see. I say, I can't see. Where are you? How can I solve this problem? I can't see. I want to see again. And you say, uh, Venerable Tomato, if you, if you've got your hand over your eyes. So this is like, like the meditation retreat. You know, I'm just telling you, you're, you've got your hand over your eyes. And you say, oh. I say, just let it go. Relax. Relax. Oh, yes. <laughs> now, if I said, if, if you were doing this, and you say, I can't see anything, you've got your hand over your eyes, and then you think, well, I should get rid of the hand. <laughs> Cut it off. <laughs> Terrible hand, no good, always got into trouble. You cut off the hand, and then what? You've got a bloody stump. You can't pick up the clock to see what time it is. <laughs> David brings in the tray of chocolate, and you can't pick up the chocolate. You have to go and pick it up with your teeth. So that, that makes it even worse, isn't it? Not only are you you're missing a hand, but you're none the wiser for it. But just this gentle warning of the problem of this is a, it's not the hand's all right, don't do anything to the hand, just let it go, put it down. So then I can pick up the clock, can't I, like this, can lay it down, can do what has to be done, I can live my life, because I have a perspective now on it. I know the hand's all right, the eye's all right, 
these things are all right in themselves. There's nothing bad or terrible about them. It's just the this the uh, uh, ignorant use of these things that is the problem. So obsessions are like being blinded by something. You can't see beyond it. You can't see see beyond the obsession. You have no perspective, so you're just caught in a, in a blind in a in a blind alley, a dead end. Can't see. But as you abide more in emptiness, then you can see. You have a space. You can see things. So it's like taking your hand away. And then you see, you can see everybody's here, who is here, if there are you know, what, any kind of problems, you're aware of it in a, in a perspective rather than uh, as making an obsession out of it. So all your, your personal life, your relationships with others, your family, your, where you work with your uh, profession and so forth, as you learn to abide in emptiness, you'll be able to work in a much better way, to be a good friend, a good husband or wife or whatever to the people around you. Not going to, it's not going to make things worse, it's going to give you the opportunity to do what you can. Sometimes there's nothing we can do. Sometimes situations are such we just have to be patient and wait. And I remember uh, with me there was one situation I found very irritating. I wanted to solve it immediately. So then I, I thought, oh, I've got to solve it. I, it was uh, another bhikkhu I couldn't get along with. I said, I want to get along with this other bhikkhu. So I go and say, we've got to get on with each other. And he said, no way. <laughs> <laughs> So that, uh, that there was this uh, urgency, I, you know. I, I don't like this idea of not getting on with somebody. Bhikkhus should should be friends with each other. Buddhist monks, at least, we should get on well. We should at least make some attempt, shouldn't we? We shouldn't uh, acting like this is ridiculous. We've got and then that that kind of situation just made it worse. Bhikkhu said, "No way." don't want it, the likes of you around me. <laughs> so out of an ideal I said, it shouldn't be like this. We should get on. We should be friends. We should be mutually supporting the Sangha, working together for the welfare of the Dhamma. And all these high, high-minded ideas for monks Sounds great. It's all true, too. But, <laughs> how is it in, in, in a situation right now, as an exist, existential situation, is that there doesn't seem to be any way that that's possible. In order to have that, it means that, that uh, some, maybe a, a change of mind or a change of attitude has to take place. Maybe it just takes patience. Maybe we have to just be patient and wait for the right time rather than forcing it. If I go, if you don't like me, I don't like that. I mean, I go up and say, like me, <laughs> I shake you. You know what I'm saying is, is, is the actual words are right, maybe right, you know, it's be the right thing to like me. But the gesture and the kind of... Uh, mood behind it doesn't create the situation where that is possible, is it? I mean, you can say, I like you, but, but still run away. You know, so the words are easy to say, but sometimes we have to wait for the time, right time in the right place. And then it, then it, and that, of course, is where when we have this spacious mind, we can, we have, we can have time to wait. We don't, we aren't forcing situations or trying to compel people or, or, or make anything otherwise, but we can, we can be aware and sensitive to time and place when the person is receptive, when the conditions are there for a reconciliation. 
or for an understanding. On an ideal level, everybody should love each other and have compassion. But on the level of reality, that we're existential reality, people don't. Many times they don't. They can't stand each other. So even though they should love each other, we find in many situations people, uh, even though they know they should love everybody, they don't. So what do we do? We wait. <laughs> we're patient until the situations are such people are evolved enough and, and uh, they're, uh, they're receptive enough for that actual uh, ideal to be realized. That's why we, we always, you know, it's very, I realize myself how important it is to forgive each other, to forgive oneself and others. Because sometimes we don't realize when somebody hurts us or does something against me, you know, I might not realize why. You know, I take it personally and I feel hurt and then I, then I, then I tend to make a judgment that it shouldn't be or that person is bad. But if I don't do that and I go to emptiness, then I can forgive any kind of insult or harm done to me and wait and see. And then things begin to become clear of why that happened, what, why that person acted like that. So this forgiveness, uh, Christianity, this is one of the uh, kind of brilliant uh, teachings of Jesus Christ, isn't it? It's forgiveness. Very powerful Christian teaching of Jesus forgiving the people that were persecuting him. They were doing everything that we wouldn't want anyone to do. and Nailing, nailing our hands and feet to a cross. I wouldn't like that. Can you imagine forgiving somebody who's doing that to you? And then laughing and jeering and uh, making fun of you, and even your disciples refusing to have anything to do with you. Uh, even the disciples didn't want to know. So then, the, and then on the cross, in the end, even God betrayed Jesus when he was thinking at least God's standing beside me and then he suddenly realizes God's forsaken him. <laughs> everything removed, isn't it? Absolutely everything. Everything miserable, painful, uh, despairing, alone, sick, humiliated, it's what we most don't want, most fear, and yet to be able to forgive. Because we realize that we, as you, as your mind in emptiness, you become much more sensitive to the fact that, that evil actions and unkindness and rudeness are done out of ignorance, not out of that anyone is, is a kind of permanently malevolent force. But these things operate out of, out of ignorance selfishness, not understanding things properly, that these things operate in the, in, in the world. So that we, and we can see that in our own lives how many foolish and selfish and ridiculous things that we've done, hopefully the people that I've harmed have forgiven me. I certainly hope they have. Sometimes it wasn't intentional. Most of the time, in fact, I think the harm I've done to others wasn't really intentional, it was just insensitive stupidity. I wasn't intentionally a very evil person, I was just stupid and insensitive. <laughs> so that kind of thing always tended to, to uh, harm and cause uh, grief to other beings. So I certainly hope that they have been able to forgive me. Then I reflect on, on that and anything that's been 
been done to me out of people I don't recall anyone ever just being deliberately malevolent just being determined to be just evil but people have harmed me or hurt me out of the same thing out of stupid stupidity and ignorance and so then I think oh, I forgive them so we forgive each other we forgive ourselves the sense of forgiveness is to be an ongoing thing because even in the even when you're practicing Dharma you're going to make mistakes somebody's going to be hurt sometimes uh, somebody's going to misunderstand you you can't there's, there's such a complex web of sankaras around that it's that it is uh, it's not you can't you can't expect everyone to to understand and appreciate what you're doing those so people will some people will feel hurt or resentful so we keep asking for forgiveness forgiving ourselves forgiving others and moving toward this abiding in emptiness really note this in, in the practice now as you uh, in this uh, next few days you you're calm now and you can and you're receptive to this you can really make this very clear in your mind so as you, when you leave here you have have that insight you have at least a more clear understanding of where to abide how to develop your practice in your daily life In meetings, I know, like in Sangha meetings or committee meetings, where people have different opinions or people uh, have uh, arguments, when I first came to England, the English Sangha Trust had a lot of problems. So that they used to have these terrible meetings where they'd argue horrible things they'd say to each other. And sit there and cringe. I thought, I don't want to hear these things. I want to get away from here. I didn't come. I, I didn't have to bear this in Thailand. Why did I come to this country? I think maybe I'll go back to Thailand. I didn't like to be in a situation where people were quarreling or saying nasty things to each other. Then I decided to use it for practice, so I started just using the situations. I'd abide in emptiness. I'd go to these meetings, I'd go empty. But I still, in emptiness, I still could be aware of what was going on. You're not like shutting things out, you're just open to it. Not taking sides, you're listening. And when, you're, when you have that space, you begin to see where the, where the misunderstandings lie. You're not being caught up in all the emotions that are being generated, but you're aware of where this person is not listening or doesn't understand or if somebody's just being downright stubborn uh, or if there's a lot of pride and determination to get one's way, one can th become aware of that uh, as it is rather than taking sides or getting caught in, in aversion and anger or wanting to get away from it. When, when there's a person like that in the room, it always helps because it, other people begin to understand also. Things can be pointed out and, thing, and people begin to... Uh, if, if, you have a, if you have at least one mindful person in the room, it helps with the rest. One silent mind is a mirror for all the rest. Even if all the others are going at each other tooth and nail... They begin to slow down. It begins to. It's reflected in the mind of the one empty mind. This is our great, great gift that we have as human beings, and not very many human beings are aware of it. Most of uh, are trying to avoid unpleasant situations, and uh, or trying to dominate situations, or or trying to hide away, or trying to uh, control everything, or whatever, but 
as we when we when we contemplate our own human predicament, we think this life is a transition between the birth of the body and its death. So it's an opportunity to learn something. And this Buddha wisdom is seems to me from what, from what I can tell, the most important, the most valuable thing to learn during a lifetime. Compared to anything else, it's all, all the rest is, is of no use. It has absolutely no good to you when you're dying, does it? Worldly knowledge, university degrees, worldly attainments, wealth, social position, achievements, are of absolutely no use when you're dying. And what is useful then is mindfulness, wisdom, emptiness, seeing things as they really are. So in this way you have, you're, say, beginning to realize how to perfect your human life, this human opportunity. How to realize it, how to perfect it, so that at the end of it, when it's time for this body to to die, you will have no regrets. You have done what you needed to do. You've understood. You've learned the lessons. Realized the truth. <clears throat>